And welcome back to Watch Us Live. If you're here, you're in the right place. It's our only show on this channel. Guys, remember, I'm giving you a watch, not one on the table, but an Omega Seamaster Railmaster. Link in the description. You gotta be in it to win it. Probably the coolest new Omega of 2017. 40 millimeters, black dial, full bracelet, box and papers. All it needs is you. And I want it to go to a YouTuber, not one of those Facebookers. All right, let's talk about the watches on the table this evening. I am all about instant gratification, and I promised you a Tudor Black Bay GMT. So here it is, the Tudor Black Bay GMT, the 79830RB. Look at it, in all of its 41 millimeter Pepsi glory. The shock of last year, to me, was not that Rolex re-released the Pepsi GMT in steel on a Jubilee. It's that it allowed Tudor to basically steal all of its thunder, releasing the other Rolex Tudor Universe GMT at a much more attractive price point available for delivery immediately. Okay, what are you getting? Well, 200 meter water resistance for one thing, and Tudor did the right thing by not increasing the case size. It's still a 41, even though they had the 43 with the Black Bay Bronze, and they could have gone to that case size for the comp application they did not they did not now the bezel is a lovely Pepsi style as you can see bi-directional rotating pilots bezel and it has a surprisingly crisp detent for a pilots bezel these things tend to be kind of duff and gummy this one is actually fairly crisp to the point that the detent and the resistance is actually kind of satisfying it sounds good and it looks just as well 14.5 millimeters thick that's the only real advantage the Pepsi GMT from the Rolex side has over this but it's an easy watch to wear and you can see these rather quirky simulated rivets style links on the bracelet. I'm going to throw this one on the wrist, by the way, three-day power reserve COSC chronometer in-house caliber. My friends joining me from around the world, I can see already in the box, we've got 49 of you. Keep the number rising. While I refresh my stream on my awful connection, yours is better than mine, trust me, let's take a look at how the Black Bay GMT looks on the wrist. Now, you guys know me, Eric Nielsen, Scottish Watches, joining us from Glasgow. I can see Christopher P. 39 millimeters in the GMT would have been perfecto. Let's give 41 millimeters a chance. Now on my wrist, you already know, 16 centimeters in circumference. The success of this watch is that it wears comfortably, and though 50 millimeters lug to lug, Tudor was smart to go with a pivoted end link, so you can see how the end link doesn't actually protrude beyond the lugs. So that's a true 50 millimeters across the wrist. A bit chunky, yes, but a redoubtable thing that feels substantial. It's got style and substance in equal measure, and the price is right at well under $5,000. Okay, jumping over to the box, I've got Watch Doctor joining in. I've got Colin Carpenter saying Tudor did a great job on this watch except for the faux rivets. I actually agree with you on that point. That was not needed, at least not across the whole model line. We've got Burning Mr. B joining in from Holland. Thank you for staying up late with me in Nine Bolts, London calling, and I'm answering. First in the box, we've got Fat in space, Fatty in Space joining from Jerusalem. He's staying up late too. And we've got True Lie, Russell 996, Colin Carpenter, Prince Wynn, everyone, and Yahia Baba from Egypt. Okay, we've got the whole world. Anyone joining in from Singapore, let me know. I'm trying to get every time zone in the box. Jumping into the watches, let's talk about one that's reasonably priced and quite fetching given that. Now, we're talking about value watches to open a show that I promise you will end with a crescendo, but this is the 2018 80th anniversary Oris Pointer Date, a tribute to effectively the fact that Oris has been making that date its icon rather than any specific design. This is part of the Big Crown collection, and you can see the titular Big Crown on the flank, but this watch is all about the Pointer Date system. No date aperture on the dial. Some folks are into that. I actually like dates on watches, but this is the watch that makes everyone happy. 40 millimeters in bronze. It's a lovely thing that has nice traditional proportioning. It's it's 49 millimeters across the wrist, so it also fits on a smaller wrist. It's got a lovely bubble style sapphire. And given the price, the water resistance, the fact that it's got a tank tough tractor Salita movement in there, this is a wonderful way to get into a really cool vintage evocative watch without the snake's nest, hornet's nest, chicanery of the vintage market. Vintage looking, but with integrity, is something I can embrace. And it's not a tribute watch because it's not a replica of anything specific that Oris has made in the past. It's just a credit to Oris that it picked its best vintage styling cues and combined them in one match. And by the way, we need no more green-themed watches. More green-themed watches, please. I'm all about that. Right here, we've got... Okay, Scottish watches. 
And by the way, guys, ask me questions about anything on the table. I love to make this an interactive show. And thank you, by the way, for making last night's Watches Tonight, the most successful Watches Tonight over 24 hours on YouTube in the history of the program. I owe it all to you. Let's talk about Rolex. I know you guys are into the brand. And let's talk about an early Zenith-powered Daytona. Now, this is the 16520 in stainless steel, but I have to promise you that this is not your garden variety 16520. First, the watch has... Uh, what could best be described as the third of the dial series. This is after the floating cosmograph, and this is after the four line, but you all know it's still a tritium dial, and it still has the inverted six down at the bottom of the dial, the top of your screen. It also has, as you can see, the four hashes in between the numbers on the, the chronograph minutes register. Let me show you exactly what I mean by that. You can see when you get close, on the chronograph minutes register, that's right. There are four hashes, and those four hashes in between the numerals and the indices are representative of one of the earlier dial styles. Now you can see right here, you've got the five lines, you've got the tritium, you've got the inverted six, you've got the four hashes. You've also got a third series bezel, so this is a 1989 serial watch, but you've got the pre straight through 78360. You can see that this is not the straight through flip lock clasp. This is a genuine 1989 early series clasp without the flip lock locking system and without the straight through polish. You can see that this is an interesting document because it lets you know exactly what Rolex's Daytona was like only 12 months into the automatic winding Daytona era. And I'll also note that although this is the dial that develops the Patrizzi phenomenon, this is not a Patrizzi dial. It does not feature the aging. It does not feature the oxidation that causes that appearance. If it had browned registers rather than the original silver, that would be Patrizzi. I happen to like dials that are not damaged, so I'm not really into patina. You can fault me for it, but I like it originally as the factory released. I like to get my vintage watches and my pseudo vintage watches because that's right on the bubble as original as possible. And speaking of vintage watches, I've got a true vintage watch on the table tonight. A diver. You might have heard of the Chichero Le Coult Polaris, but have you seen the Polaris too? You may not have, because the original Polaris with 1,714 made is a far more common watch than the Polaris II. This is reference E870, made from 1970 to 1974. 1,120 examples of very 70s style diver. And it was split over three different dials. The gray dial you see here, the blue dial with the Lecoult markings for the American market, and the red dial. The gray and the red are the rarer of the three. The blue is the most common. You can see all of the original dial tritium, the original plexiglass over the bezel, which which works beautifully, a mineral crystal, and you can see the blasted finish of the case. 43 millimeters, this is a full-sized, modern-sized watch. It's also a memo vox alarm, and you know what that means. We're going to sound off. 100 meters water resistant back in the day. I wouldn't test the theory today, but it is remarkably preserved. Now that is the sound of an original caliber 916 automatic Memovox. That was the first rotor winding Memovox, but this watch has two voices. I'm going to let it speak in its softer voice. Listen how crisp this vintage bezel is. None of them are like this. Go ahead, take your Rolex 5513, take your 1680. Turn the bezel. It will not sound like that. This watch is an incredible survivor right down to the floral pattern case back. This is the 70s writ large and a remarkable survivor that's been through factory service. I'm actually thinking about making that mine, so please don't buy that. Jumping into the box right here. We've got the Watch Lounge, Howdy from Myrtle Beach. We've got Genesis G wearing the Omega Seamaster 300 meter blue ceramic. And we've got Barry BKT saying, sounds like my razor. And then Fatty in Space asking, why don't they make these instead? You know what? I, I would love to see a very limited run tribute to that watch from JLC. I would like to see it with the blue, the gray, and the red dials. Make 
make it rare, make like 12 of each. People would go nuts. And then right here we've got Edward Suave saying, I'm wearing a Timex Expedition, and that's good because I love all watches. King N, hey Tim, good to see you. He has a curiosity, would a Black Bay be a wise investment for a first purchase of a luxury piece? It's a good tutor to own. There's a lot of them out there. If uh, investment is a word I would not use on a Tudor Black Bay, unless you can find something like the Black Bay Black, which was made for maybe six months with the the black bezel, the original movement, the ETA. Uh, I wouldn't, unless you're getting that original Black Bay Black, the first run Black Bay Black, I would not necessarily consider it an investment. And even then, if you buy that model, I'm gonna say you're maybe 15, 20, 25 years out from realizing any kind of return. So buy it because you like it, get it pre-owned so you don't pay lists because they will depreciate. Full box, full papers. Try to get one that still has some warranty on it. I actually recommend the Black Bay 58. I think it's the coolest offering at the moment. If you're gonna get a tutor that's not a Black Bay, get the Heritage Advisor Cognac because it is just too cool. Okay, jumping back onto the table, let me show you a watch that I love because it's actually the best of both worlds. Now, I'm not a Tag Heuer fan. I'm just not into the brand. Nothing wrong with it, but it doesn't, it doesn't compel me in any emotional way. This watch came out at Basel 2013, and this is a watch about which I can get excited. DLC Black Titanium. This is the Tag Heuer Carrera Caliber 36 Flyback Racing. So it's black titanium, 43 millimeters. It's the Tag Heuer iconic Carrera lugs in a Carrera case with a Zenith flyback El Primero movement. Now you can see the dial is all applique, not printed. It's also a sunburst gray that's absolutely explosive. All of this 100 meters water resistant. And though it's tough to see, there is an El Primero caliber 405 which you might remember from the legendary Rainbow Flyback Aviators watch, here doing business as the Tag Heuer Caliber C36. It's a true column wheel, 36,000 vibration per hour, historically relevant El Primero. Remember, back in 1969, Seiko, Heuer, Buren, and Zenith racing to create the first automatic chronograph. You can dispute who got there first. None can dispute which one remains the most relevant and historically important. The El Primero in a Carrera case. Like I said, the best of both worlds. And a fairly rare watch. It was expensive back in the day. Jumping into the box right here. Watch Doctor saying chronograph the most useful complication. Freddie Turner saying a LeCoult JLC alarm is always worth picking up for the pure enjoyment. And I agree with you. I think that even when it's not a dual time, a Memovox is the ultimate travel watch. You just set it to your local time and then use that alarm to remember where you got to be and if necessary, wake you up. But if you want to see a watch that can legitimately claim to be one of the ultimate travel watches for those who need a second time zone, this is the exquisite 42 millimeter rose gold manufacturer caliber parmigiani tonda hemispheres now parmigiani makes every part of this watch except the crystal the pivot rubies and the strap which is made by parmigiani stakeholder hermes 42 millimeters you can see that there are little recessions in the case flank that allow the strap to be so close to the case that you can pull it down over a narrow wrist so throwing this watch on the wrist you can see how easily i'm able to wear this 42 in rose gold now you can also see parmigiani has opened up the dial a allowing you to actually see the reverse side of the movement base plate complete with pivot jewels. You can also see how in ethereal fashion the dials seem to float above the base plate with its linear Cote de Genève. But let me show you why I called this the ultimate travel watch. Because along with very few others, including the Senator Cosmopolite and the JLC Duomet UTT, you can actually set both the hours and minutes of that second time zone independently of the main time, realizing that we have small local increments as minute as 15 minutes at variance from the standard time zones. Parmigiani intelligently allows you to set the minutes and the hours so no matter how many additional time zones North Korea decides to create, you can still match perfectly. And note the motion works visible underneath that open worked dial. Sensational. You can also see that if you want to move everything in sync, you can do so. Automatic winding, twin mainspring barrel. You can see the guilloche cut of the rotor. Two mainspring barrels and a 50-hour power reserve caliber PF337 based on the same architecture that Parmigiani builds through its Vauche manufacture arm for Richard Mille. You'll see the same twin barrel 
automatic winding architecture in something like an RM11 as the base caliber. Get the real deal, get the Parmigiani. Okay, back in the box right here, we've got Paul S. saying too busy, it's not for all, we've got cleaner models coming up, and Bobby Smith sounding off, hey gang, and then I could see Porsche Maven saying another watch which is hard to read, beautiful but defeats the main purpose. Okay, let's talk about a watch that I think you minimalists are going to adore. This is a watch that came out last year for the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics in Korea, and it was easy to miss because it was there and gone in the press, but this is the Omega Olympic official timekeeper. Technically not part of any Omega watch family. It looks like it might be a DeVille or a Connie, but it isn't. 39.5 millimeters in the most traditional of golds, though you can't see it on camera. There's a lovely eggshell off-white coloration to this domed enamel no-date dial. That's right, domed enamel no date dial note the vintage omega marquee and logo note the diamond polished applique and curved yellow gold indices note the leaf style hands which have been hand rolled to trace the domed profile of the dial and on the wrist note that the watch is only 44 millimeters from lug to lug so it wears exquisitely yup you better believe enamel dial yellow gold case no date and solid gold movement components on an Omega watch. This is caliber 8807, 18 karat rotor, 18 karat balance bridge, and you can see around the, the movement, the flange, featuring all of the Olympics and host cities for which Omega has acted as the original timekeeper. Right at the beginning, Los Angeles, 1932, and it continues into cities that have yet to stage the Olympics, ending also with Los Angeles, 2028. 55 hour power reserve, six position adjusted coaxial Matas chronometer. It is also amagnetic to over 1.5 Tesla, over 15,000 Gauss, very impressive, nicely executed, and as simple as they get on the dial. You'll note that there is a vintage Omega logo on the crown, a vintage Omega logo on the dial, and a vintage Omega logo on this exquisite polished and blasted pin buckle that is only used for this special edition watch. It's rare you see a bespoke pin buckle on an Omega, but here it is. Guys, that's yellow gold that I can embrace. And jumping in the box, I could see right here, Porsche Maven agreeing finally, nice Omega. I know you're a minimalist. You like the simple things in life. SJ, hi Tim, big fan. SJ, I'm a big fan of you. You make my job possible with your views. And Sam Davies saying the back of that watch is awesome too. And then we have a question from Turkish Meister, who is our friend in Turkey. Is there a name to the style of the indices on this Omega? In general, this type of index is called dart style. You could see that it's been faceted. Dart style indices are generally faceted. Sometimes you'll see them referred to as delta indices. Now, let's talk a little bit about a watch that might have the most extravagant dial on the table, and after the Parmigiani and the enamel dial Omega, that's really saying something. This is a 500 piece limited edition from 2016. This is the Grand Seiko High Beat GMT. SBGJ021 with the Awatayama dial designed to look like the snow scatter on the peak of Mount Awate outside of Seiko's northern Japan Grand Seiko manufacturer. Now the dial is lacquered, it's galvanized, it's stamped, it's all of that. And as with the Omega, all of the dial furniture is hand finished and diamond polished to an extent that even the Omega can't quite match. The manual dexterity that goes into making those parts is quite frankly, an art form in its own right. Then you have the dial. Then you have the polyhedron 44 GS case, which I will denude of its fingerprints because it deserves better. Black polish on this polyhedron case, you can see how faceted it it is at the lug ends. You could see that 44 GS case, iconic of Grand Seiko since the late 60s. And that black polish is achieved by holding the stainless steel straight against a tin milling plate. It's done by eye, hand, and experience. So this watch, hand finished inside, hand finished outside, and just like just like the El Primero, it beats away at 36,000 vibrations per hour, 10 beats per second. You could see 40 millimeters and easy to wear. It's short from lug to lug, so I can recommend this watch for a smaller wrist. A sensational dial, and yes, a GMT. We were talking about travel watches. Here's another worthy entry in the category, and possibly one of the best.
That's an emotional watch. You can feel that. That's, that's the kind of watch that you don't buy because of its intellectual appeal. That's what Spring Drive is about. That watch is all about the pulse and the heartbeat. And speaking of which, let's talk about Zenith, because we talk about the El Primero constantly, but there's so much more to the manufacturer. Hundreds of movements, hundreds of patents, and a caliber we don't often discuss, the Elite. This is a late 1990s Zenith Elite Automatic, 36 millimeters in yellow gold. It features the Elite Caliber 680, the original 26 Jewel Elite Automatic. It has hacking seconds. It has a quick set date that you can set in both directions both directions. Try that with an El Primero. It's a gorgeous traditional dress watch that's only 42 millimeters lug to lug and powered by Zenith's newer movement, Origin 1994. It was also the first Zenith caliber to be designed with the assistance of computers. 7.2 millimeters thick on the wrist. This is an ultra thin automatic reminding us that the Elite was designed not to do battle with the likes of ETA, but with the likes of, for example, the Gégère Lecoultre 889 and the Girard Perigo 3000 series. Exquisite, with almost manta-like winged lugs. That's a traditional dress watch right there. That is a dyed-in-the-wool, I-like-small-thin traditional dress watch watch. And jumping into the box right here, Naresh Pape saying, super clean and classy about the Omega with the enamel dial, and then right here, Fat Elvis advising all concerned, you gotta go Swiss, and then Jean-Claude Beaver, he of damning fame, says clean dress watch, Zenith, super underrated. Jean-Claude Beaver, the tribute name that, frankly, you could miss. I like it. Okay, Marwan al Qasam saying gorgeous, and I've got another one for you, Marwan. I have a Langa. Alanka Unzona, 181540, 40 millimeters, yellow gold, solid sterling silver dial, and because it's an 1815, you have those Arabic numerals with the railroad track outboard, and it's a thin watch, as you can see on the wrist, under nine millimeters thick, 55 hour power reserve, manual wind, broad, it's not undersized, this is Alanka doing a larger dress watch, so this is a timepiece that fills out a wrist, and my wrist 16 centimeters, you can appreciate the watch is not designed in the same spirit as that Zenith, this is designed to look like a 19th century pocket watch dial on a 20th century wristwatch frame in 21st century wristwatch dimensions. And I like all three. A watch that has real heft to it. And as you can see, as with any longa, a gorgeous case back. You can see the jewels set in chaton. You can see the three quarter bridge. You can see the glasuta stripes. You can see the German silver, that nickel copper zinc alloy that has that wonderful golden glow. The free hand engraved regulator, or I should say half bridge for the balance. And then the regulator with a black polished swan's neck adjustment adjustment mechanism, blued screws fired, black polished swan's neck, black polished case clamp screws, black polished cap to the escape wheel, and again, the dial itself is made of sterling silver. Good fun. A uh, question from Nine Bolts, how do they get the whiteness to the silver dial? They, they galvanize it after they cut it. So they machine it, they finish it, and then they galvanize it to get either black or silver, depending on the model. I should also mention that Longa's rose gold dial, the, the rose gold dial, for example, from this year's uh, perpetual datagraph tourbillon, that is that is solid gold. So that is the one exception. And then right here we have bump, bump, bump from Noah B. Tim, I have an opportunity to buy a no date sub brand new tomorrow for MSRP, but I'm concerned about it being replaced next Basel. Would you pull the trigger? Yes. A at list, you have a chance to get it for 7,500 US bucks. I would do that in an instant. If you don't like it, you can resell it for more than you paid. And even if a new one comes out next year, remember, in general, Rolex's habit is to replace the no date after the date, replace the date first. So you'll probably have a little bit more time before you have to worry about obsolescence. But let's be honest, old Rolex watches are collectible Rolex watches. No one faults a 1680 for being an old model. No one's going to pay any less for this Zenith powered Daytona because it isn't the latest reference. If you own a no date and you get it at list, whether it's replaced or not, you'll still be able to sell it for the same money or better even if it's replaced next year at Basel. Jumping into the box, we've got Fat Elvis saying I don't think he's a Seiko fan. And then we've got Mark S. Tim, what do you think? Why do you think AP went for 21,600 vibrations per hour for the, 20, for the 3120? One, anti-counterfeiting, even with a solid case back, you can put it on a chronoscope and know you're not getting a 7750. Two, <clears throat> 
I think it was done to increase the power reserve. Uh, to get that 55 to 60 hour power reserve with a big heavy balance, something had to give. So they went with a lower beat rate to extend the power reserve. And ultimately, I think that's why they went with the lower rate. Now, let's talk about Omega, a brand I adore. We spoke about Rolex, we spoke about Tudor, but Omega actually straddles the price point of both Tudor and Rolex. And back in the mid 2000s, Omega had ambitions for something grander. Omega wanted to go all the way up the price tree. And you could see the price range increased dramatically with this DeVille Chronoscope Rattrapont, powered by a Omega Caliber 3612 derived from a Blancpont Frédéric Piguet. The Frédéric Piguet, a double column wheel Rattrapont, 52 hour power reserve, double column wheel vertical clutch chronograph. You could see this is finishing on a level that in 2005 had rarely been seen on Omega watches. Free sprung coaxial chronometer. You've got that 52 hour reserve. You've got the two column wheels, and you've got the split second functionality with the ability to time two concurrent events and individually split the seconds and find the difference between them. You also have a dial that is lush with applique indices, sunken registers, a triple date, and one of the first triple dates. This became a very, very influential feature through the 2010s and 2000s. And the idea was that even if the minute hand were covering the date, you could see the succeeding and preceding date, so there would be no trouble gauging the true date. Now, of course, the watch is an absolute masterpiece mechanically, but aesthetically, a lot of folks are going to take it or leave it. It is incredibly complex. I, I believe 2637 is the vintage Omega reference to which these particular lugs are attributed, but they're exaggerated in a 41.5 millimeter case that looks like it's got to be at least a 43. So this has always been a, con a rather controversial watch for both its dial and its case form, but I have to admit I had a huge watch crush on this timepiece during the 2000s, and I still do. I go back and forth between the polished steel black dial version and the satin finish gray dial version you see here. By the way, 100 meters water resistant, so this one has all of the toys. Jumping into the box right here, Barry BKT. Tim, can we see the AP on the desk? You better believe it. We're going to see both of them right now. Okay. In 2017, to mark 20 years of the Royal Oak Chronograph, Audemars Piguet decided that we were going to have a new Royal Oak Chronograph. Not all new. They stuck with the 41 millimeter case from 2012, but they gave us a reprofiled dial. Now you can see chronograph hours and minutes are emphasized, and constant seconds at 6 o'clock has been minimized, uncalibrated, and a smaller register. Now this is a very special piece, one you're likely to see only at AP boutiques, with a blue galvanized dial and it is a blue that's made just for the red gold watches and you also note the red gold of the registers contrasting beautifully the watch is relatively slim only 11 millimeters thick and broad at 41 it is a big thing 51.5 millimeters lug to lug what they also changed alongside the dial and this is a rather stealthy change, but for 2017, what appear to be screw-down pushers no longer are. The pushers look like screw-downs, but they're now just hexagonal shoulders rather than true screw-downs. You can actuate the chronograph without screwing anything in or out, and the watch is still 50 meters water resistant. Not much to see on the case back, but interestingly, this is the same basic architecture. This is the 1185 movement from Frédéric Piguet. The 1285, based on the same essential running gear, is the basis for that Omega caliber you just saw. So I mentioned that Omega was high horology, and truly it is. With this kind of watch in its family tree, believe it, that Omega Rattrapont is the real deal. This is also a bomber machine. That's a little too rich for me. Now in 2015, Continuing the Pride of series, Audemars Piguet released the Royal Oak Offshore Pride of Indonesia. Indonesia is an interesting country. It's made up of 17,000 islands or so. It has 700 ethnic groups, and it is the world's largest majority Muslim country. And for a special occasion, a special watch. The Pride of Indonesia made in 100 pieces featuring rose gold and titanium. This one actually still has some of the original packaging plastic on it, so I apologize. Someone didn't enjoy this watch properly. You can see the national emblem on the case back, the eagle, the symbol of the nation, and you can see that this is a titanium and rose gold watch, and that's a striking combo. You can see the colors and the tones on the case, but also the dial, and note that there is no tapisserie on this dial. Rose gold hands, rose gold registers, rose gold indices, and a rose gold tachymeter outboard, but the dial itself is an anthracite vertical satin finish, smooth metallic surface. There is no tapisserie here. Look at the attention to detail. Even the chapter ring for the magnifier of the date is rose gold. They 
went all out. The Pride of Indonesia alongside the Pride of Argentina, in my opinion, the two best entrants in the collection. And underneath the case back, we spoke about it, Caliber 3126 Manufacture Automatic Chronograph. That one is 100 meters water resistant, so throw it on a strap that's water tolerant. Napi makes a great rubber diver. You can absolutely take that one swimming between any of the 17,000 islands of Indonesia. Jumping into the box right here, we got Logan Smith saying, loving that gray with the gold. I think Chris, one of our Chris's anyway, is checking out. Anyone who checked in, I dearly appreciate you. I can see right here, Mark S. Tim, do any modern APs have anti-magnetic tech? Today, no. In the future, possibly. We'll see. The last of the anti-magnetic offshores went away with the the old rubber clad. The rubber clad, I believe, was the last of the anti-magnetic offshores because for whatever reason, that model, right up to the end, continued to use the JLC movement, which was thin enough to shove an iron cage like a Milgoss inside the offshore case. Let's talk about a watch that blew my mind in 2016. This might have been the most surprising watch of 2016. It was my first Basel World. I was at Breitling's villa inside the Basel World show. It was a building in a building, and they pulled out their first ever full ceramic watch. Well, that was interesting, a baby step for Breitling into the world of modern materials. This is not a baby step watch. One of a hundred made at $40,000. This is the incredible Super Ocean Heritage Chrono Works. Why is it incredible? Because inside this ceramic case is a ceramic movement. Bridges and plates of ceramic. The train wheels, center, third, fourth, and escape are all silicon. The watch has been reduced from 47 joules to 37 joules, and all of this with a new balance made at Breitling. They made their own balance. Let me see if I can stop it from beating for a moment, but there are five innovations in this watch, and I'm gonna do my best. I'm gonna hack the movement and try to show you everything that makes this caliber B01 chronograph movement exceptional. A balance made of two parts, nickel and brass. It's completely immune to thermal variation. It's free sprung, unlike the conventional B01. With the combination of silicon wheels, silicon pivots, and ceramic bridges and plates, most of this watch operates without lubricant. It's just, the, it's just the balance staff right there. Moreover, there are spring-loaded tabs on the gears inside the chronograph clutch system to reduce play. And on top of that, the escapement, you could just see it glowing blue under my finger, but the escapement is all silicon with unlubricated lever and wheel. You could see the chrono works on the bridge. This is an all materials innovation movement. There is nothing about this that is standard Breitling. It is a column wheel and vertical clutch and similarities with the B01 end right there. Exquisitely handmade and hand adjusted in only 100 copies. It also expands the power reserve from 70 hours to 100 hours via reduced friction in the train and the escapement. As far as Breitling gets, this is as innovative as they get and this is number one of 100. This might be technically the greatest Breitling watch ever made. That's right, ceramic bridges and plates, silicon train, proprietary balance wheel, silicon escapement. Throwing it on the wrist right here, I have Burning Mr. B saying that is badass black on black. And by the way, the clasp for this one is also ceramic, so you can't scratch it easily. Dustin Van Patten, impressive tech. The watch looks like plastic. Well, ceramic will do that. JBO Surf saying 40K, give me a Longa or a Jorn. For the 25,000 I think we're asking for this watch, I, I would probably consider this over one of those. This is that special. This is now a deadline. The new Breitling ownership and management have discontinued the Chrono Works project. There may never be another one of these. There will always be another Longa or Jorn. 46 millimeters in ceramic and 100 meters water resistant. It is not a bashful thing. On the other hand, if ever a watch had a right to be this stark, this bold, this strident, it would be the Chrono Works. It's even got a micro adjust in the clasp. Jumping into the box right here, we've got SBSB saying, what about TT Daytonas. Well, all I've got for you is the one Daytona on, on the table tonight. This, of course, is the Zenith-powered 40 millimeter Rolex Daytona 16520. It's my sole Daytona. I'm doing my best to please the crowd. I've got another Rolex though, and this one perhaps a little bit more relevant as it's a watch you can no longer obtain. This is the 116 710 
LN. This is a timepiece that for many marked the apogee of GMT development in the post-steel Pepsi era. For a while, you couldn't get steel Pepsi with the Supercase GMT, but this watch right here might have been the most striking alongside the black and blue with the full black lacquer dial, the green GMT hand, the green GMT script at the base of the dial, and the all-black Cerachrome bezel. This might be my favorite from that generation of the GMT. And you can see the watch is handsome, substantial, relatively slim in profile, and very useful. We were talking about travel watches. This is the ultimate Rolex travel watch. True, I like the Sky Dweller, but I'm also sentimental. It's between this and the Explorer 2 for me. I like heritage references that have been around. And this is also a very swimmable pilot's watch. 40 millimeters, despite the super case, it's 51 lug to lug, so it does need a big wrist. This is an imposing Rolex watch. And unfortunately, this watch has all of the original Rolex factory plastic on it, so the last owner did not enjoy it properly. I hope the next owner will enjoy it to the fullest extent. And jumping into the box right here, we got Paul S. saying can't get past the lugs, he's not into the super case, and Sam Leno saying hi from London. London, I got something for you. You're calling me, I'm going to answer. Let's talk about something that is absolutely over the top in every way. Patek Philippe 5131J. Cloisonne enamel with a dial that is created by first establishing the cordons using gold wire, small gold filaments to create the image of the land masses, and then applying vitreous enamel in between the cordons and around them to create the image of the mid-Atlantic. You have Africa, you have Europe, you have Central Asia and most of Russia, you have North and South America, all of it surrounded by a world time dial that allows you to keep track of the 24 principal time zones, and thanks to a system that was developed by Patek and Louis Cotier between the 1930s and 1962. You have the ability to jump your reference city. Your reference city is up at 12 o'clock. Now I'm in Sydney. I'm jumping over to Auckland. I'm jumping over to Anchorage, Alaska. I'm jumping to Los Angeles. The watch does all the math for you. To avoid marring the dial, Patek Philippe has signed the watch on the bezel at the top and the bottom. 39 millimeters in diameter, it's only 10.9 millimeters thick. On the case back, caliber 240HU uh, Universelle, 48 hour power reserve, micro rotor automatic, immaculately hand finished, Cote de Genève, engine turned prolage, mirrored englage on the edge of every bridge and you can see it lighting up. Every screw had black polished and again, because of the micro rotor you can see all of it and the case remains slender. This is a beefy 49 millimeters across the wrist, so if you want a full size Patek Philippe dress complication, this is a great way to do it. The subsequent Patek Philippe world times and those that came before the 5110 or the 5230 they're just not as bold as this watch on the wrist. Bold in yellow gold. I hate that word, bold, as it's applied to modern watches. It often excuses poorly proportioned oversized watches. In this case, it feels like the watch was made to wear that appellation. Okay, let's see what we've got go left, and let's see what we've got in the box. Okay, I'm going to finish with a big piece, guys. We are talking Patek Philippe. We are finishing Patek Philippe. Let's go with the Nautilus annual calendar. The Patek Philippe 5726, launched at Basel World 2010. For me, this is the ultimate combination of Patek trademarks. Patek invented the annual calendar in 1996, and in 1976, Gerald Genta scrawled the shape that you see right here for the Stern family. The Nautilus, Patek's iconic design with Patek's iconic complication, and all of it only 40.5 millimeters in diameter and 11.4 millimeters thick. You can swim with it, 120 meters water resistant. The annual calendar needing adjustment only once per year, the jump from February to March, and this watch on the rarely seen Patek Philippe rubber strap. It's designed to look like the leather, both top and bottom, but it's fully swimmable like the watch itself, equipped with a twin Twin trigger double deployant clasp. This watch in full steel is powered by the gorgeous Patek Philippe automatic caliber 324 base. Finished like a Patek Philippe should be. Free sprung, adjusted in six positions, silicon hairspring, and with the Patek Philippe crest on the movement and the silicon hairspring guaranteed factory accuracy. Minus three plus two seconds per 24 hours or better. This is one hell of a way to end Watches Live. Guys, thank you so much for joining in. Jean-Claude Beaver and everyone else in the box, I appreciate all your handles and your hashtags. 
Join me on Instagram, where the videos continue after the lights go down. I have an all-video review Instagram, and I'm going to be updating tonight. Will I see you there? Thanks so much to you. Thanks to my crew, Timeout, Timout. Enter to win that Omega Railmaster, and thanks for logging on. Thank you.